Hello, my name is Annette Delu, and you are listening to The Heart of You. This is episode 48, and today we're going to talk a little bit about being fearless. I'm going to be discussing this with Charlene Light. She's a fearless coach and a soul guide who combines spiritual, psychic, and practical tools to help move you from the old, outdated version of who you are into the powerful co-creator you came here to be. Charlene, thanks so much for being on the show today. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. I like to start every episode with a spiritual awakening story. So why don't you go ahead and give us your journey, your story? What got you here? (laughs) Oh, gosh, that's a big question. Well, I'll just start from I spent my 20s kind of living what with what people told me would would bring me the most happiness, right? Like get the graduate college, Mm. get that job, get the 401k, make a certain amount of money. You know, I was like on that track, even though I had this secret passion of wanting to be a singer. I had always dreamed of being a singer. And although I was doing that sort of in my late 20s, I didn't really share it all that much because it was really not something that my parents and my family were supportive of, really just because they understood how hard it was to actually quote unquote make it. So Mm. I understand that. But growing up with that belief, which I realized later of, I'm just, I internalized that as like not being good enough. And so what happened was, is when I was approaching 30, I was like, you know, I don't want to wake up and, and it's five years goes by and I'm still at this job. I was just miserable. And I was like aching for something different. So I'd always dreamed of moving to New York. I was like, what if I just moved to New York and I quit this corporate job and I just gave music my all? Like, what would that feel like? You know, mm. I was kind of following that that musical or that starving artist trope. Like, what would it feel like if I gave my music my all and moved to an entirely different city where there's just artists like me everywhere, you know? So that's mm-hmm. what I did. Moved to New York, quit the job, the safety, everything, showed up, decided to become a bartender, even though I don't drink. So I was doing everything that like I thought would lead me to my success. You know, I'm like, I'll just be a bartender, right? Because that's so cliche. Yeah. <laughs> and I went to bartending school and I did get a job. I didn't lie about it. It was so funny. I got this job at Bullmore Lanes, if anybody is familiar with New York City, which was like a very popular bowling alley that was kind of like this hip place. But mm. anyways, so I'm working all these odd jobs and then it started to hit me like, you know, I'm not happy doing this. I didn't feel satisfied just waiting until my job was over to kind of feed my passion. It started to weigh on me. My age started to weigh on me. I was in my early 30s and Everybody around me was in their early 20s and I just felt like I don't fit. So then the the first thing I did was just like quit that job and decide to go and work at a sports club or like a very fancy gym because I'm like, this is more aligned with me. Maybe if I just change the job, that would mm. be helpful, right? Yeah. So I'm working at this fancy sports club LA on the Upper East Side and I'm still, although that gave me some relief and I will say, because I tell people this a lot now, which is like, you have to really know what you value, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're just following what everybody else is doing, like you're going to stay miserable. So at least I was a little bit in alignment then. And I was meeting people that actually did kind of help me a little bit. But anyways, long story short, after two years of just like grinding and, and putting on shows and and then I just kept, I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. And the pressure of like, why haven't I made it? Why didn't I have a manager? I was comparing myself to everybody like a series of divine kind of like horrible things happened. And I, I finally was like, okay, I can't continue like this. And I remember I got mugged. That was like the biggest thing was, oh, um, wow. yeah, it wasn't horrible or anything, but it shook me. And I will yeah. say that like the universe, like, get, you know, sends us these signs. And if we don't, it's like Oprah always says first, it's a whisper. And then it's like kind of beating over the head. If you yeah, and then it's a kick in the pants. Yeah. yeah. And I really, <laughs> that was the mugging for me. It was like this divine intervention of like, girl, you got to stop trying to act like everything is okay. Like mm. I remember walking back into my apartment after, and I looked at myself in the mirror and it was like, 
my face was kind of beat up a little bit. And I was like, wow, it's like everything I'm feeling on the inside, just like staring right back at me in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And it gave me permission to feel it all because I don't think people realize, I certainly didn't, like, what does it feel like when you go after a dream and it doesn't look the way that you thought? What do you do with all of that grief? It's literally, you're literally grieving a dream that you've held since you were like, for me, since I was a little girl. And all the ideas of like who I thought I was and where I was headed. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I just didn't know what to do. And so I finally paused and I was like, okay, like I get it. I'm just going to surrender here. And I remember going to see a therapist, thank God at the time. And she said, you know, you don't know what all of this is preparing you for. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget those words because I, I hung on to them. Like it was my life. You know, I was like, you mean I'm being prepared for something? Like it never, it never occurred <laughs> right. to me. Yeah, it never occurred right. to me that somehow this was happening for me, mm-hmm. you know? So that's when that seed was planted. And I started to, the first book I picked up was Marianne Williamson's A Return to Love. And that just like cracked me open because it was essentially like the medicine that I needed, you know, talking about you basically are, are, well, actually it was a workshop that I took called something different from women. And she said to me, your thoughts and your words create your reality. And I was like, Mm -hmm. wait, what? And I, I didn't realize at the time that I was contributing to the way my life was going. All I did was complain about how nobody was coming to my shows and how everybody else seemed to be, you know, further along in their career than I was. And I didn't realize, you know, what you put your energy around is going to grow. So I kept, manifesting, nobody showing up at my shows and everybody else Mm. doing better than me because that's all I talked about. That's all I thought about. So everything was skewed on negatively. Mm -hmm. And so when I picked up that book and I realized like, wow, I'm actually contributing to my life. I'm not a victim. Like it's not just happening to me that I'm contributing it to it, to it. Then, well, then I have the opportunity to change my life by the thoughts that I think and by the words that I say. And so that's really what started was it was not getting what I wanted. Mm-hmm. broke me open and I was like, okay, I'm ready. And so I, I I say this a lot because I feel like people will get called in their life, like something major will happen, whether it's an illness or like literally it'll feel like the rug is like thrown out from underneath you. And that could be your greatest opportunity. Like that is your soul calling you and saying, hey, there's another way to live, you know? And so that was my wake up call. And I just didn't stop. I just like picked up that book and it was like, boom, I like picked up Wayne Dyer. I picked up, you know, Deepak Chopra. I mean, I just didn't stop. It was like, I was absolutely, I had this appetite for this kind of language. And this, it's like, almost like I was remembering this was how life was supposed to be lived. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had just literally woken up to that and I was like, wow. And so I shifted everything. I started doing gratitude lists. I started to be really mindful of the way I would speak about my life. I stopped gossiping. I stopped complaining. Like I just, and I kind of went to the extreme. I don't know if this happened to you, but I went to like the extreme of like, I never complained about anything. I never, you know, because I thought if I put those words out there, I'm going to get more of it. But Mm. later, and as, as I'm sure you are aware, it's like, it's important to actually be real. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And if that's how you're feeling, it's important to get those feelings out. Like that is, it's about balance, you know? Right. So I understand that now, but at the time I was like really strict, Mm -hmm. (laughs) really good student. And I did change my life for sure. A thousand percent, you know? So it's interesting that you mention the, the big things that happen, right? The, the big, you know, kicks in the pants, so to speak, you know, because the one thing that I have now come to realize is that when I get the nudge, I don't actually let it, well, hopefully, I mean, sometimes it's, it's not under our control, but when I can help it, I, when I get the nudge that, Hey, you got to make a change, I'll make the change and I'll know that this is coming versus waiting and not listening to your body, listening to your intuition, and then eventually getting the kick in the pants. Right. So like to actually sort of get that heads up right away is always helpful. But in the beginning, you don't, you don't, you don't know any better, right? So you asked me if I went through this. I did and I didn't. Like I went through that voracious reading and gathering of information. I absolutely went through that. It went like for almost two years, I think. But prior to that, 
I actually didn't even know I was going through a spiritual awakening. I just thought I was going crazy. So I, mm-hmm. I had no yeah. reference for what I was doing. When you were asking me if I really made sure I wasn't saying anything negative or anything else, like I, I don't think I really had the opportunity to do that because mm-hmm. like I said, I didn't know I was going through the spiritual awakening for the first few years. And then once I realized that I was, and once I started doing the research and everything else, that's when I started saying, oh, okay, cool. But like for me, it was a little bit of a different experience. Like I didn't feel like I could fake the universe out into thinking that I'll never speak negatively or I'll never have a negative, you know, like I, it was, it was stressing me out so much to not think negatively that I didn't understand how to not think negatively. Does that make sense? No, <laughs> so- absolutely. And you know, and I think that's a good point because I'm naturally a positive person. And so my whole life I'm, and I all, I didn't realize, but as a coping mechanism, as a child, I just numbed. Like mm. I, so it was very natural for me to just not talk negatively. I mean, even mm. though I'm telling you, oh, I was complaining about my life. I was doing what the way I was brought up, which was like, oh, this is the reality. The reality is I'm not getting a lot of people on my show. So I didn't think it was complaining. I just thought that's what was happening. But I didn't mm-hmm. realize that I kept talking about it. I was putting energy behind it. And that's yeah. what I was getting, right? Yeah. So, but because I was shifting my mindset, I um, was like, oh, this totally feels right to just not talk about. I just meant not share it with anyone. Like I didn't open up to friends or anything. I did it at the privacy of my own room, you know? Mm -hmm. I thought by doing that, I was like, oh yeah, like I can do this. I can just cry alone and work through it myself and and just not never complain and never say anything bad. You know, like Mm -hmm. I just thought I could, it wasn't about, I mean, I wasn't conscious. Like when people talk about spiritual bypassing, which sometimes I, I used to be triggered by because you don't realize you're doing it. Like we have to cut people sure. black and like yeah. be shaming people when they're just trying to like literally go from one extreme to the other, which is like, okay, like I want to do better. So I'm not going to say this, this, and this. And you don't realize that you're spiritual bypassing it. You just think like, no, this feels better. It feels better to just not talk about it. It feels better to not think about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a swing of the pendulum. It Absolutely. is literally part of the process. So really? yes, I like when people bring up spiritual bypassing because it is important to acknowledge, Right. but it's not something to be shameful of because- right. Ultimately, that kind of defeats the whole purpose anyway, right? I mean, really, but I do find that online, there's a lot of like calling out people. And I'm just like, you know, really, we don't have to do that. It's okay. <laughs> like Everybody's where they're at, right? Everybody's yeah. And, and the people who do that are very much in their spiritual ego. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about how the ego gets spiritualized too. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And and even with that, that is still perfect and fine because that's exactly where those people are. Absolutely. And that's perfectly fine. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah welcoming it all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So once you sort of realized that you were on this path, what happened next for you? Well, I was still working. I went back to a corporate job, which I promised I would never do. And I remember after the first week, just like crying, like, I can't believe I'm here. I like total tail between my, my legs. Like I just felt so humbled. Like, what am I doing? But it was, it was actually a blessing. It was a grace because it gave me some time to actually apply these principles. Like it's one thing to read the books, right? We have to actually go out into our world and move through it differently. And so I was building trust. I was building self-belief in myself and and really belief in something greater than myself. Right. And so those two years back at that job, and also it was different because I wasn't hiding who I was. And the other jobs, I was hiding who I was. In this job, I was like, no, like everybody knew I'm a singer. I have, you know, I do all these things. And I was adding more of that into that job. Like I even, cause I'm a really creative person. I even decided to create this newsletter called the cube chronicles. Cause we were in cubicles and I thought I just wanted something to do that felt like me and that was creative. And so I added that Mm. and like, it really bonded me. So I was just, I'm like, I'm just going to be me even in this mundane job. Like I'm grateful for it. Do you see how the mindset shifted and how I used it to my advantage, you know? 100%. Yeah. And then what, and then I remember thinking, well, what else do I love? And at the time I was, yoga had really saved me. And because again, it's in our body. We have to remember 
that it's not just about going to therapy and clearing it cognitively, like it stays in your body, every cell of your body. So I knew that going to yoga, I was moving through so much, like I would have, I would be crying in Shavasana. And, I, and so it saved me because it wasn't about the words. It was about just literally, can I trust my body again? And I was mm. building strength again, you know, because after you, after you've been kind of attacked like that, you do in your body, you feel like, can I trust it? What is, what else is going to come around? So I was using yoga in so many beautiful ways to really build that trust. And so I knew I loved yoga. I'm like, what if I just went through teacher training at this point, this was like 15, 16 years ago in New York city when it was not as prevalent as it is now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let me just sign up. I don't really want to be a teacher. I don't think, but let me just go through the process. So I signed up went through it and still was not certain I was going to teach. Cause again, it's like, um, you know, it's not like you make a ton of money teaching and I'm living in New York city. I'm like, what do how do I even do this? Right. Yeah. And what I remember was like little synchronicities would happen. I ran into a, a, a friend who was part of that, my yoga teacher training. And she was like, where are you teaching now? And I was like, Oh, I'm not. She's like, why you were so good. I'm like, really? And so there was that. And then there was like, I remember trying to get a job at Lululemon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me just get out of this corporate job. Anything, God, anything. Can you help me get, you know, Lululemon seemed perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I didn't get the job. And I was like, oh, I was so, <laughs> <laughs> I was so upset that I was like, and then I heard this voice, well, what do you really want? I was like, well, I want to teach. So I went on Craigslist. I saw an ad. At the time, I was living in Astoria, Queens. I saw an ad in Astoria, Queens for this new new yoga studio. They were looking for teachers. I set my resume, which had nothing on it, but that I graduated. I got a call. They freaking called me and offered me a class. Can you come in Saturday? I mean, that's wow synchronicity. Like, you don't have to do it all on your own, right? Yeah. What do you really want? Skip. You can skip lines here. You don't have to like. Right. (laughs) And so then I had another really beautiful synchronicity. And I don't know who. I was familiar with New York, but there was this major corporate gym called New York Sports Club. They owned like a hundred gyms in the city. I walked in one day, still, I don't have much experience at all. And I was like, how can I teach here? The guy was like, oh, there's an audition on Saturday. I was like, okay, I show up. It turns out you had to fill in like this whole online application. It was like they, you know, they don't accept you right away. You wait like a year to get invited. I just oh, show wow. up. I show up and I was like, um, she doesn't call my name. I walk up to her. I'm like, you know, I was just told this audition was happening. Can I audition anyway? Sure. I got in. What? I got in. So (laughs) all of these things like showed me like, okay, we're doing this. So I quit that job. But before I even quit that, before I got all this, I had quit the corporate job. I just got into a place that I was done. I remember like a colleague of mine got promoted and I just, it felt like a sock in my stomach. Like somebody hit me really hard and I was like, what am I waiting for? Mm. Waiting for something outside of me to tell me, give me permission to leave? Like just go. So right. I walked in to my boss's office and I just said, I'm leaving. So yeah, I did all of this after I quit. I just want to give the audience context that I'm, why I call myself a fearless coach, because I did these things before there was anything, like I just left without any job to go to. And this is So you had no safety net, nothing. Nothing. And this yeah. was at a time that it was, it's a lot scarier the second time. You know, this is the thing about fear. It's like you've got your, the first time you do something, you kind of have this like excitement because you're like, oh, this is the first time. So even if it doesn't work out, you're like, oh, it's okay. Cause you know, you don't know what it's really, what it's going to feel like when you do it again and then again and then again. Oh boy, you are stepping through like three rings of fire because mm. now it's like your body, everything knows what it feels like to have it not work out. So how, what other story are you going to tell? How are you going to walk through this differently? You know? So yeah. the second time is a lot scarier, but I did it. I felt free. And I remember I was like, I'm not telling my parents because they were in LA. I'm not telling anybody. This is my decision, my choice. I own it. And I'm just saying, God, like I trust everything's going to work out. And it was definitely challenging and hard. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and being like, what, you know, what do I want today to bring? You know, you have to really intend and have an intention for your day when you don't have a job to go to and give you that, you know? Mm. And I was like, my job is to get out there and to just like walk into every single place and like say, okay, can I teach here? You know, and just make it work. And so all of these things kind of led to really building a beautiful yoga career. And I became a teacher and I I ended up getting a job 
teaching at every major gym in New York City. And I, and then after like a year or two, I remember thinking, I don't like the feeling of just, you know, being at the mercy of somebody giving me a class, you know, because mm. you're still like collecting a paycheck. So I'm like, how can, and I just heard this voice, like, do it on your own. I would rent out spaces and studios and I would, because I had built a huge community now. Like, pe- now people were coming to my, all of my classes. They weren't just going once a week. They were like, where else, are you, when else can I come? So they were coming Mondays and Tuesdays and, you know, and yeah. I was And so I remember doing a workshop for the very first time on my own. And I was like, I made, I baked cookies. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, we're going to call it the holiday, holiday heart opening class or whatever I said. And, I, and I'm also a singer. So you know this. So I brought my guitar. And I was like, I'm gonna ser- I'm gonna sing in Shavasana, live music. So there I was adding an ad- and part of me like that was different. That was beautiful. And I had 30 people sign up and I made more money in that one workshop than I made the whole week. And I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. You know? mm-hmm. so it's just every step of the way, trying it, scared, didn't know if it was gonna work, kept doing it. Did it with my first retreat to Costa Rica, then the second retreat to Guatemala, then Peru, then Morocco. I mean, it's just you keep going. It doesn't go away, the fear, but you just keep going anyway. I think the willingness the willingness to move through it gets easier because yeah. you have enough experience of going, either way, I'm going to be okay, you know? Yeah. It's something that is super, super important on this journey, and I feel like it is something that is also the hardest, which is taking that leap and trusting that the universe has your back. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Louise Hay, but Uh she wrote the book, The Universe Always Has Your Back. And it's something that we all know. We all know that when you do take that leap and you're on the right path, the universe is going to show up for you and things are just going to fall into place. But you have to take that first step. And that first step is absolutely the hardest. Yeah, And that's where you come in. So this is what you excel at. This is what you have cultivated over the course of your experience. And then after, obviously, you started teaching yoga. So now you are a fearless coach. <laughs> what exactly is a fearless coach? Like, what do you do and and how do you help? Well, I help get rid of all of your fear. That's what I do in that. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, that's obviously not possible. Sure. I call myself a fearless coach. Well, I essentially help you change. I Mm. help you transform. I help you evolve. I help you go from where you are, which is lost and disconnected from your true self, feeling like a victim in your your circumstance in your life, feeling like everything is going wrong. I help you move from there into really the person that you came here to be, to Mm. the powerful co-creator you came here to be to the version of yourself that you have an inkling of. You do have a knowing of this this version of you. You do know you have this potential. And when you feel this disconnection from it, that's the pain. That's Mm. the call. That's your soul calling. That's that's the answer. That's when you wake up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to have to move through a ton of fear. Of course, it's scary to change. It's scary to change. Big changes, small changes, all of it is scary. And so- I essentially help you through this journey, you know, and I do Mm. it through, I have a three-step process. I do it through number one, awareness, right? We have to become aware. We have to kind of become conscious of, you know, again, like what, what are the voices that are playing in our minds? What are the belief systems that we're holding and how can we, we change them? And I have a whole process which we can get into if you want, but where I, I do belief clearings on, on people. I do soul readings and belief clearings. And then the second piece, the big piece and the big chunk is, is really I assign you fearless action steps. So it's not just about doing something scary. It's also about going, well, where are you hiding in your life, right? Yeah. Like, what are the aspects of yourself that you're not allowing others to see? And how can we pull some of that out into the world? Because again, like we came here to be whole beings. Mm-hmm. So you like, for instance, there's so many, all of my clients have these secret passions. Like I wanted to be a singer, but they were told they weren't good enough or their parents didn't think it was okay. Or they didn't feel they could make money. That's really just the mind talking you out of it. Right. Yeah. But they had this passion. And so it's just sitting there dormant. And it's like, your soul gave you these gifts, whether it's to sing, to dance, to write, to play, whatever it is to come alive. That's what makes you come alive. Mm. That's what makes you, you. Your unique 
imprint of who you came here to be, it lies in those special, beautiful passions of yours that you're just not doing anything with them. Mm -hmm. So I really help pull those out and go, okay, like I've given many people, like you're going to start an Instagram account. You're going to sing every single day. Like, so I'm really adding more joy more feeling of like, like they're feeling connected to a part of themselves that they just wouldn't allow themselves permission to, right? Mm. So you do that enough, then there's an adrenaline happening. Then you start to feel like there's inspiration flowing. Then you start to be able to li listen and, and hear your own soul speaking to you, your own inner voice, right? Mm. And so that's the third piece is awakening is that it's, I really help people awaken to their own co-creative power, right? Their relationship with their higher self. And what does that look like? And how can we build a tool set that that's really unique to you? You know, people think like, oh, I have to meditate every day for this amount of minutes, but it's about creating something that's going to feel doable and workable and exciting for you. It could be different. It can be you journal every day. It could be you. I'm a big component of voice notes. I mean, oh, yeah. huge voice notes. So I walk along the Seine River and I do voice notes. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to look like a traditional, this is what it means to be spiritual. Like that's the fun of it is like the more people get into who they really are, the more authentic their spiritual toolbox and their their experience really starts to, to show up as, right? It becomes yeah. really unique to them. You know, I have a client who she draws pictures now like of, of emotions. Like I help people through a lot of difficult emotions, right? I have a lot of tools and a lot of practice through this. She starts to draw like almost like a children's book, like what anger feels like in her body. But this is a beautiful practice to, and you know, I often say like, we want to ask our emotions, like, what do you, what is it that you want me to know? Like mm. how can I serve you? So there's just so many beautiful practices that I've I'm sure you as well have tried and and really love and and continue to build my arsenal of tools as I live the rest of my life. But this process is so exciting for me because it's so it's an element of me and at the same time it's like we it's like you you go through something painful that you feel like you'll never be able to go through and it's like it's our it's our opportunity and privilege to now share those tools and how we got through it with other people, you know, to say you don't have to suffer. Like there's another way. And I don't know if you know this, but I, maybe you don't, but when I turned 40 is when I decided to do 40 fearless acts where I spent a year stepping into fear. And really it was just an honest, my intention was like, I just feel like I'm stuck. Like I had been teaching yoga for a few years even though it seemed really good, I, there was a part of me that was like, I know there's more, I, there's so much more that I have to offer and I want to have more fun in my life and I don't want anything to hold me back. So it was like, I'm, I was like, I'm going to do things that I've never done before that straight up scare me and that just make me laugh. Like I literally, one of my fearless acts was to go skipping, to join the skipping club in New York City. And I swear to you, I have never laughed that hard in my life. <laughs> when I was like, I was like, what do I need for skipping to skip? I was like, I need a, I need to get a, um, one of those fanny packs. I can't skip with a big old purse on my shoulder. Oh my I gosh! Gotta have one. I mean, I was so prepared. And this is what's so funny when they when they put the uh, the meeting place. I get there and nobody was there, and I was like, oh my god, did I miss the skipping club? I was so bummed because I literally did buy a new fanny pack for this. <laughs> and then and then I was talking to my friend, and he was like. I was like, I don't know what to do. He's like, well, you could ask a stranger to skip with you. And I'm like, no way. I can't do that. That's ridiculous. You know, I'm in Soho, like the heart of New York City. Right. Thought, right as I'm talking, texting with my friend, this guy comes up to me and he's like, um, are you here for the skipping club? I was like, <laughs> oh my God, do I look flat? like I should be in the skipping club? And then it was so funny. And I'm like, God damn it. Now I'm going to have to ask him. We got to skip. Like there's just no other way. <laughs> so right. I oh my gosh. Like, um, do you want to go? He's like, yeah. So we, I swear to you, I was crying, laughing. So it was one of the most. <laughs> so like, the I organizer, was... the organizer didn't even show up. I think we just got the meeting place wrong. We ended up like they were supposed to end where we started. I mean, it was ridiculous. But oh, it was funny. It was so funny. But I just, I mean, I did crazy things. I got naked for an art class and ended up having my period. So I had to like cut the tampon string. And I did like, oh my I, walk, I tried on wedding dresses as a single person, you know, and I, I passed out love notes to strangers in New York City. And I, I mean, I just did all kinds of stuff. I asked a, you know, cute stranger for a kiss on the cheek. You know, I just, every day I was 
pushing myself and, and stepping out of my comfort zone. And really, I was following this like natural inclination of like, what sounds like fun? What would just be so like, you know, and I, and because I was building a habit of doing it, the ego voice just was taking the back seat. I had no choice but to be like, okay, I guess she's going to do it, you know? <laughs> that is inspiring. That is super, super inspiring. I, because I'm, I'm thinking about as you're talking, you're kind of striking a chord in me just sort of looking at some of the fears that I still haven't dealt with, you know, because Mm -hmm. fears, you know, as you know, fears come off in layers. It's not like you can sort of necessarily get rid of a fear all in one fell swoop. You know, it it happens in over time in layers. There have been various fears that I've had over the course of my lifetime. Fear of heights is one of them. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm living in a larger building. I'm on the 11th floor, you know, so Mm -hmm. now flying doesn't scare me as much as it used to. But the idea of like, zip lining or bungee jumping, I'm like, oh, absolutely not. Never, like never going to do it. Like, you know, like that's, that's, that's sort of the dialogue that's been in my head. Now, another fear that I have been working on recently, and I know you're going to be able to relate to this and especially most expats will relate to this as well is my fear of speaking French. And Mm. I have this this weird, irrational fear. And the thing is, is that I've studied French for years and years and years. Then I moved here and realized that I literally know nothing. Like, even though I've studied it, I know nothing. And, you know, my French is decent enough where I can get around and I can do the things that I need to do. But it still scares me because, like, I'll walk by a shop. And if I want to walk into the shop, I hesitate before I do. If I was in the US, I would just walk into a shop if I wanted to walk into a shop. I will hesitate here because I'm like, oh, do I want to have a conversation? Do I want to potentially not understand what the person is saying to me? And do I really want to have this interaction? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll be like, no, it's not worth it to me. It's not worth it to me to go into the shop and and look at whatever it was that I wanted to look at. And I'll just keep on walking. Right. Mm -hmm. And I find it's easier to do when I'm with other people. So when I'm with other people, I'll go anywhere. It doesn't matter. But if it's just me by myself, I have this really weird irrational fear of going in, not being understood or not understanding, not being able to communicate, that kind of thing. When a lot of times you can sort of mix in English words, you can mm-hmm. make mistakes, you can do all of these things. It's not a big deal. Right. But for some reason, there is something within me that is still making me hesitate. So yeah, I'm still sort of exploring that and figuring out, okay, why, why is it that I'm afraid of that? Like, what is the reason for my, my fear. Well, I know that some of it has to do with simply a desire. Like there are times when I'm just like, I just don't feel like dealing with it. Like, I just don't feel like dealing with it. I'm just going to move on. But that part we can kind of like put aside because there are times you just don't feel like dealing with certain, with certain things and that's fine. But when you have the fear itself and you don't really know where it's coming from and why, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you find the information about that? Like, so when you, have fears that you may not either be aware of or that you don't know how they started or where they originated and right. and how to get rid of them, right? Well, I mean, the first step is to welcome the fear, right? The fear yeah. is actually our protective overbearing mother that is just letting us know that there's some sort of unprocessed wound that is hidden behind it. Mm-hmm. And so that's the first step is we want to welcome it. We want to say hello to it. And we want to understand, like, okay, what is this fear protecting me from? You know, and we want to go into the feeling, right? Because, yeah. Because if, if we keep trying to talk ourselves out of it, then it's mm-hmm. just going to keep staying in our field and it really won't go anywhere, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And, and really it's <laughs> never the condition. It's never the condition of the person. It's always the pattern. Mm-hmm. So, so I would ask you, like, what do you think? Like, what do you think this fear is protecting you from? If you can think of a feeling, what is the feeling that it's protecting you from? Um, let's see. Embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Feeling, what is the word? I would say maybe unintelligent or feeling not good enough. That's another Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Being uh, the feeling of not being perfect, not being able to to be perfect. Exactly. Would you say that's the strongest feeling, strongest emotion? Yeah, I would say so. I would say not being perfect. And then feeling embarrassed, like those, those two would probably be the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Sure. And I just want you as you're thinking, right. It's not, so now you're in the mind a little bit, but Mm -hmm. I want you to just 
access your body a little bit, like kind of drop into the body. And and when you think about feeling not perfect and not mm-hmm. good enough, where in your body do you feel that the most? Yeah, solar plexus mm-hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. And if you were to assign it a color, and just just using our imagination, what color would you give us this emotion? First color that's coming to me is blue. Okay, awesome. So we're just going to take, we're just going to kind of use our imagination a little bit, if you don't mm-hmm. mind, that's okay. Yeah. And I just want you to imagine a blue energetic cord coming from your solar plexus. Mm-hmm. And this cord is going to move all the way back in time, all the way back in time to a very, very young you. The first time that you felt embarrassed or not perfect or not good enough. And it's going to it's going to land on a memory and it doesn't have to be perfect. doesn't have to be true. It's just the first thing that's coming to you. Well, the first thing I'm connecting to is the emotion of it. So I'm starting mm-hmm. to feel really emotional about it. Mm-hmm. The memory hasn't come yet though. That's okay. And the mind's going to maybe try to analyze and you don't need to worry about that. Mm-hmm. We're just gonna use the imagination, like just allowing the imagination to kind of bring you back to maybe the first time you might've felt this way like landing on a very, very young you. You know, I'm I'm getting three. Okay. And I'm getting an image of my dad. Okay. And tell me, image of your dad and where are you? So I am, um, I can't see what's going on around me, but I can see myself. I can see that I'm playing with something. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I can see at the moment. Okay. So you're playing with something mm-hmm. and your father is there, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so- how are you feeling? Are you, what is the relationship? Are you playing and is he's watching you or are you playing and he's not? He's not particularly paying attention, but he, he is in a certain way. So it's like he's paying attention peripherally. Okay. And so this little girl, this younger you is feeling conflicted in some way that he's maybe not paying attention or not paying as much of attention as maybe she would like. There are elements of it that are like him not paying attention, but then also, oh, okay, yeah. So I did something that I was really proud of, and and it's like he didn't care, and he Mm -hmm. didn't acknowledge it. Mm, Got it, got it. So what did this little girl do in order to receive to receive love or safety? Because when we're children, those are really the only two things we care about. Yeah. And so we're just kind of going through, we're going back to like the memory, the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. And when you made a choice in this moment to learn how to do something to receive either love or safety in this moment, because right now you're, you're telling me that she didn't feel that way. Right. Yeah. So what was the coping mechanism that she used? I withdrew. Mm -hmm. You withdrew. Tell me more. So meaning like, because he wasn't paying attention to me. I withdrew within myself. So in other words, I'm seeing myself almost like turning my back to him Mm -hmm. and not showing him this cool thing that I did or whatever it was that I was proud of, Mm -hmm. like not wanting to show it to him anyway, because he didn't acknowledge it. Like he didn't want to pay attention when I wanted to show it to him. So therefore I don't want to show it to him. Got it. Got it. Beautiful. So you kind of learned that I'd rather just not share Mm-hmm. then share and get possibly hurt or rejected. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what do you think the best thing that came out of this? Like if you're looking now from the lens where you are now, like looking as you grew up and got older, what do you think the best thing? Like what do you think your soul wanted to learn? Hmm. I mean, the first thing I'm getting is not needing the outside validation. Exactly. Yeah. So we always want to look for how it served us, right? So back then you built a limiting belief. You basically said, I have to act like I don't care or I have to withdraw in order to get love or in order to be safe, right? Either one. We would test for those, right? There was, and we would use words. And this is the second part of it. We use muscle testing because it's in your body. What do you think the best thing came out of this? Like the best thing from you holding as you look back on your life now seeing that you made this sort of negotiation, right? The ego kind of makes these negotiations, like what do I have to do to be loved or to be safe? And the moment you made that choice, which totally is understandable. You said, I'm going to withdraw or I'm going to act like I don't care or whatever the word would be and be safe, right? What do you think the best thing that came out of that? Like as you look back on your life now? 
What are some positives? So uh, some of the positives are doing what I do now, which is Mm -hmm. to essentially go back and, you know, sort of rewrite those aspects of myself that that aren't true, right? So Mm -hmm. there are aspects of what we choose as, as souls, obviously, when we incarnate on this planet and the parents that we choose. So the fact that this came at such an early age, mm-hmm. this was something that, you know, sort of formed a really strong belief system from a very early age. It, it, it says to me that it is something that I was needing to work through. Like it is something that needed to happen so mm-hmm. I could come out the other side and be able to stand in my power. And like the reason why it's in the solar plexus is because that's it. It's, it's your, it's my own personal power. Right. Right. Yeah. You had said something, if you don't mind me bringing this up, cause I loved it, which was that it, it also made you not need outside validation. Yeah. Like you learned, okay, I'm going to have to be proud of myself. Yeah. Right. Because I, I, you, you, you got the impression like it wasn't going to happen from the dad or who knows what else. Right. Right. That's a really big, big plus. And so we want to understand like, you know, a limiting belief is there for a reason. Mm. It has a purpose Mm -hmm. and it's serving us. And so until we understand why it will just stay there, because why wouldn't, why wouldn't it? You're getting some out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to see it. We have to go, okay, I see how this is serving me and I'm ready to let this go because now you're seeing how this new circumstance, which seems like it's not related at all, but now we know it is, which is about you speaking French. Mm -hmm. And there's a fear because now you you really do want to engage and you want to put yourself out there and you want to be vulnerable and you want to try this new beautiful language on because you're living in this amazing city. (laughs) Exactly. You don't want this limiting to belief to show up anymore. Right. You're, you've outgrown it. Right. You've outgrown it. So that's what I do. I walk people through this process. I get them to see it. it's connected to some sort of emotional experience that you've had since you were a child where you first decided, oh, I get it. I'm not going to do this thing because I want love or safety from somewhere else, whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. You go from the limiting belief into an empowering one, which would, of course, not need any outside external validation because you yourself, as you said, are a powerful soul and you were learning how to be unconditional, right? Right. So what I would do then is I would ask you to stand, we would do muscle testing and test for the very specific belief that you're carrying and you do it through, you know, it's kind of like your body is a pendulum, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the yes moving forward, the no's moving back, although everybody's a little bit different. And then I would ask you to say the belief. And we can do it now if you want, if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so why don't you stand up? Okay. (laughs) I can't see you, audience, but I'm trusting. Okay, I'm standing now. Perfect. So we're going to trust the body again. You're going to try to drop into the body as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to have you say yes, 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 and just see which way you move, right? It's either going to be forward or back. Sometimes it's to the side. You'll just tell me. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, that that was backwards. Backwards. Fabulous. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you're going to say no, no, no. No, no, no. Yeah, that's forward. Perfect. So your backwards is yes mm-hmm. and your forward is no. Awesome. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you're going to say, hang on, let me just look. I have to act like I don't care in order to be safe. You'll say that okay. and then you'll see which way you go. Okay. I have to act like I don't care so I will be safe. That is a yes. Yeah. All right. So then I would ask, can I clear this for you? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. So hang on. I'm going to clear this. And we're going to replace it with, I'm ready, willing, and able to know what it feels like to be safe without acting like I don't care. And you'll repeat that. Okay. Can you repeat that one more time? Sure. I'm ready, willing, and able to know what it feels like. I'm ready, willing, and able to know what it feels like. To be safe without acting like I don't care. To be safe without acting like I don't care. It's safe for me to honor how I feel without acting like I don't care. It's safe for me to honor how I feel without acting like I don't care. It's safe for me to be vulnerable and show my vulnerability without acting like I don't care. It's safe for me to be vulnerable and to show my vulnerability without acting like I don't care. It's safe for me to be loved for showing my vulnerability without acting like I don't care. 
It's safe for me to be loved, to show my vulnerability without acting like I don't care. Beautiful. And then we're going to say the old belief to make sure we cleared it. So you say, I have to act like I don't care in order to be safe. I have to act like I don't care in order to be safe. And I went forward. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. So the forward is no. Yeah. So that means that you don't carry it anymore. So what we're doing is everything is energy. Everything is vibration, Mm. right? So that's why I'm asking for the specific words to get them right because everyone's a little different. Yeah. And um, we're clearing it out of your energy field and then replacing it with these unconditional beliefs, right? Yeah. And then we just want to make sure we cleared it. So now you have this awareness. Mm -hmm. There's no longer this, why am I doing this? Now you understand why. Yeah. And this is a beautiful thing because now when you walk into a store, you're going to be more empowered to be like, it's safe for me to show my vulnerability, be loved for it without acting like I don't care. And you'll walk right in or whatever you want to do. But you know, right, you'll have right. this choice. I always that's what it's about. We want to feel empowered. We don't want to hide behind something because we don't understand it, because it's just gonna stay there. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because that is something that is is permeated through my relationships as well for my romantic uh-huh. relationships, you know. So yeah. Exactly. That's what we also want to remember. It's never about the circumstance or the circumstance of the person. It's always the pattern. So now this is going to show up in all your whole life, every, every category of your life in every area, which is so cool. Yeah. That's why this stuff this work is so powerful. Yeah. You know, so I'm curious to know like how this is going to show up in your, in your personal life as well. <laughs> I am too, because here's the, the really fascinating part about this kind of work is that I have done a ridiculous amount of work on myself and my relationship life and unconditional love and shadow work and all of the things, right? I've I've done so much of this work. And yet Mm -hmm. here we are on this podcast and you just unearthed another origin point of a fear that I haven't looked at from this perspective yet, right? So I may have looked at this fear in another way at another time. But as Mm -hmm. you shift and change in your spiritual awakening process, the way that you look at things changes and the way that you approach things energetically changes. So like now in this very moment was the exact right time for me to address this, right? And so you were able to now point me in the direction of that fear and of that that belief system Mm -hmm. and sort of bring light to it. I mean, and that's, it's such incredible work. I love it. Oh, thank you. No, and it's, and first of all, thank you for allowing me to do that. It's very vulnerable. And and there's a whole myriad of experiences and emotions that come up when people do this work, because it's very deep, you know, we're going yeah. into a memory. What I think is so powerful is like, you know, I was working with a client who came to me after a failed, you know, IVF treatment, a miscarriage. And she was like, I just don't know what to do. And I was like, we have to get off the topic completely. Like you are, that's the other thing is like, people think that like, you cannot get the solution from the same energy and vibration of the problem. Right. So, and I knew that this was not the problem. It wasn't about the IVF or the miscarriage there. This is like, this is her invitation. This is her soul calling her something else is going on. And this is the wake up call. And, And it's working. It's like, showing her through this particular circumstance, right? Yeah. Which in her case is amazing. So we got off the topic completely and we spent like the next three months, like looking at every other area in her life. I'm like, okay, we worked on issues about control, not trusting her body, not surrender, you know, surrender. And so we did these belief clearings that had, I never once said the word pregnancy. I never once said mi- miscarriage. It was never, ever brought up. Mm. Let me tell you something. The first time she tried to get pregnant, by on her natural account, she got pregnant and now her kid is three months old. Oh my God. That's beautiful. A miracle. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. we got off the topic and she was so willing and ready to do this work. Mm-hmm. And we started, to go, okay, where else, what else in your life? Like, this is an invitation. Let's go deep. Let's get there. So that's what I'm saying. Like, it's never about the thing you think it's about. Mm-hmm. It's greater invitation, the greater call that yeah. your soul is like, Hey, you're not in balance. There's something else going on. Right. And, uh, yeah. So it's, it's really powerful work and it's very exciting. I mean, I've changed my life. I mean, transferred my life. I've, I've just like you, I was like working through all the things I need to, you know, I'm like, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing. And then it was like, 
once I got to this specific tool and this modality and really connecting to my soul, mm-hmm. because as you know, when you are a channel and you're starting to do readings for people, you can't help but start to build a trust because you're like, how did, I could have never known this stuff. Right. You know? <laughs> so I have to trust now my intuition. And so it just, that really shifted my whole world and was like, oh, okay, I understand what faith means now. Mm-hmm. I believe I wasn't even in the ballpark of like what faith means, you know? Yeah. So it's just a beautiful, fascinating journey to to get to, to come to. And again, like we're here to to really be whole beings, to understand the fullness of things. So, you know, it's it's a journey. And like you said, it's it's a de-layering. We we just kind of pass through another layer, but we're at from a from a higher perspective, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting because this came at exactly the right time from the standpoint of I had been resisting getting a tutor or taking more classes. Mm. And, you know, I just started with a new tutor about a month ago. And so I'm actually seeing him twice a week, every week. Mm. And it's, it's slowly, but surely, you know, starting to get me to open up and be okay with making mistakes. And like, yeah. he's, he's a really wonderful tutor and he's really holds that space to allow me to make mistakes without making me feel like crap, you know? And right. so it's really cultivating that. So I think that in this moment, this, this was able to sort of come through because I had already taken that one step. Yeah. Cause what I was feeling was that my inability to communicate and to be myself and to have a personality in French was actually keeping me separate from this country Mm -hmm. that I love, this country that I have made my home, right? Exactly. In relation to what we just worked on, it's keeping me separate. That's exactly what I did in that memory, right? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's all connected. It's really, really beautiful. Awesome. I love it. I love it. What fears are you currently working on? Are you, is it easy to sort of identify your own fears? Because I always know that when it comes to doing sessions with clients, it's always easier to read for other people than it is for yourself. Do you find that the case for you or no? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Of course, because there's blind spots. Yeah, of course. You can't know all the things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's what relation, that's, that's where you use your life. I use my life to show me what my fears are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so easy. I'm like, oh, there's there's the trigger. Okay. I mean, I can tell you right now it's showing up in intimate relationships with men and and even just having like a crush on someone and how it's like got me so unnerved. And it's mm. like, what is doing that? It's like because of this deep fear of like of rejection or looking stupid or whatever it is. So it's like and really coming to terms with like letting go of an old idea of what I think a romantic partnership is supposed to look like, mm, like mm-hmm. all of that and showing up as my full self and who I am now and not fearing being, oh, that's too much, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't end. It doesn't stop. I would say for anybody listening, because I definitely don't want to discourage people thinking like it never ends. And like, because you know, like when you're just starting, it feels like, oh, it never ends. What, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? But I will say like what I, I don't know about you, but for me, like I'm so practiced with like leaning in mm-hmm. that even when it's like you're going through something, I also at the same time hear a voice saying, and this too is God's love. Mm. This too is God's love. And like, there's a grace that comes over me because I understand it's here for me. It is here for me. And one thing I will say about fear is like, when you think about the physical, like, what does it feel like in the body? It feels like a fire. Mm. And we, we need that fire because that fire is going to burn through the old aspects of who we are, the old limiting beliefs you know, the old patterning. So we need that fire. That mm-hmm. is our great, that is how we move from where we are to our fullest expansion. Yeah. So we fear is good. And when you think about it that way, it's like, oh, cool. Like you can get excited. Like, and here we are again. Awesome. I'm ready to like shed this new layer. I'm ready to move through another ring of fire. Like bring it, you know? <laughs> and those rings of fire are, are less hot the yeah. longer you do this. When you first start out, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's pretty hot, right? You're just like, yeah. oh God, I don't want to go through that. But then over the course of time, the flames get lower and lower, right? And it takes mm-hmm. less time to get through what you need to get through. 
left. Yeah, for sure. The the right now I can say because I mean there was a lot of emotion coming up in me while we were doing that exercise. And so mm. I can definitely say when we're done with this podcast, I'll probably have a good cry. But awesome. But I mean it'll yeah. happen for probably about a half an hour or maybe 20 minutes, and then it'll be done and that'll be the end of it. Whereas, you know, the beginning of my awakening, maybe that would trigger you know, a mini dark night of the soul where I'd be crying for days. Right. So it just depends on where you are in your journey as to how much the energy affects you. And the way that I like to look at it is like, you know, when you do that first initial clearing, that very first powerful clearing of something, it's like Mm -hmm. you're getting rid of like the biggest part of it. And so it Mm -hmm. takes the longest to get through that part. Then as Mm -hmm. you go in through the layers, you're getting into the core of what it is. And those layers are smaller, right? When you get into the core of something. So it may get easier and easier and easier. But then once you get to the actual core, the very center of it, that's Mm -hmm. like that last big push. You know, it's like that last big, big, like monster that's coming out of the closet. And you're like, okay, am I going to fall for you? No, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fall for you. You're just a monster in the closet. Get get back in the closet, you know, like, (laughs) you know, so either that or no, get out of the closet and leave my house, you know, right, 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 totally. (laughs) Yeah, but that's a really good distinction to make. And it's important because, you know, you just went through this like it was, I couldn't tell you were emotional at all. But, and it's important that I, and I always tell people we have to let the body also release it. So that what you just said about crying, like, I mean, to me, that's such a beautiful way of shedding another layer, Mm -hmm. right? Another guard to our heart. So it's like you just actively with the intention, I'm releasing this now. You know what I say all the time? Mm. I hold my hand to my heart and I said, it's safe, it's safe to feel this. Yeah. It's safe to feel this now. Like that's such a beautiful mantra, like, because you really are capable of it. It wouldn't come up if you weren't capable for it, to mm. release it, you know? So we have to know like we're equipped for this. Yeah. We really are. And to ask for these things, like mm-hmm. to ask for the guidance, to ask for, to call out, like I call all the time. Sometimes I'm like, you know. God source, like, can you let me sleep all through the night tonight? <laughs> oh, I do that all the time. I do that all the time. I'm like, okay, can you please just like, like can I just sleep yeah. all through the night? I'm like, I'm okay. You know, but then I still have to get up and go to the bathroom, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but you know, you can ask for these things and we have to remember, like we came here on the leading edge, like mm. really our, our spiritual side, our souls, everybody's here to work for us. So like, it's okay to ask for things and then also to really take care of ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, through these you know, letting our bodies. And I don't know, a great tool for me is breath work. I don't know if if you've ever done it, but it's so powerful. And it's a way to just like, let the body release without getting like the mind can kind of check out, you know? Um, Yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried breath work yet. I actually am interviewing a gentleman named Niraj who started Soma breath work. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Okay. So I'm going to be interviewing him on the podcast actually in the next couple of weeks here. I would love to try breath work as well, because I know that that is a powerful tool. And that just goes to show like, I mean, you can be on this journey like I have for more than a decade and still not have tried all of the modalities yet and still not doing all of the things yet, you know, and just to actually address what you had said earlier, how you were like, well, I couldn't even tell you were emotional. Well, you know, there's an aspect of that that I was I mean, I was definitely holding back like I was trying not to cry. Because I knew if I did, I might just lose it. And then, you know, you'd be sitting here listening to me sob for, you know, 15 (laughs) minutes on the podcast, you know, so like. It would be also beautiful. Right. (laughs) I understand. I understand what you're saying. And I just want to just say, like, feel so proud because that's so vulnerable of you to be like, I mean, I didn't even, I was just like, let's just do this. Let's just go right in there. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And you're like, okay. So um, I just want to honor that and, and it's okay. And you can say stuff like that. You can be like, you know, I'm going to, um, I'll take care of you or I'll take care of my body or whatever it is when I'm ready, you know? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, like if this was a session, like an actual session you were doing sure. for me, I would just let it go. I'd be like, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just going to sob. But like, it, it's, you know, not cute with stuffed nose and snot when you're <laughs> like, you know, recording a podcast. So <laughs> I want to save my viewers from, from that, uh. <laughs> That it's audible so joy. <laughs> no, it's so brave. This work is so brave. Like, just know wherever you are on the spiritual path, yeah. whether it's, you know, the first time you're trying to do this work, like, it's so brave. And I say there's nothing more fearless than than being who you really are. And that's what we came here to do. And so when you decide to to step forward towards this path, to answer the call, to do this work, 
you are saying, I want to be who I am. Yeah. I know you have, you, you know that that's why you're feeling the pain because you're like disconnected from it. Like you're stopping yourself from, from taking from, you're kind of outgrown who you are, mm-hmm, right? We're meant mm-hmm. to grow and evolve. It's like, so we got to say yes. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. How does somebody work with you? Is it multiple sessions? Do you do like packages? Is it single sessions? Mm-hmm. How, do, how does that work? Well, right now I do, so I do one-off sessions. So like what we just did with you, and then I also do a soul reading. That's usually about an hour, an hour, what is it? An hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can just book one session. And then the coaching is where we really get to go deep because that's like three months or five months. And that's where I'm adding probably about three of these, maybe five of these if we do five months. But the majority of it is like the journey really is a co-creative kind of journey where we're working together in each session, we show up and we're like, okay, what's, what's, what do we want to tackle next? You know, but there is that goal of moving towards again, who you came here to be and to give you all of these tools so that you feel literally like, oh my God, I feel like the complete different person than when I started, you know? And uh, so, yeah. And then I do, I I'm starting a, um, an awaken your soul group coaching program. I just finished the first round. So I'm going to do another one um, at the beginning of the year. And then I'm also a yoga teacher, as you know. So I'm doing a yoga retreat. I'm planning one for next summer for the South of France. And we're going to do a whole combination of this kind of work and yoga and then going out and having fun. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) That's what I love to do. (laughs) That is so, that is um, incredible because one of the things that I'm trying to work towards at the moment is to actually do retreats maybe three or four times a year where mm-hmm. we would take like a full weekend and, and, you know, do the Akashic records. Maybe there'd be yoga, maybe there would be meditation or, you know, numerology or whatever it happens to be. But then mm-hmm. what you just said is so super important is to have fun. Like mm-hmm. so many of these retreats that, that people go on and they're amazing. They're amazing retreats, but it's like the fun aspect is sort of missing. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. You and I are going to have to talk offline because I think that yes. uh, this could be a lot of fun. I would love to work together. I would love that too. Well, and I always say like, like if I were to leave this this planet, right, like tomorrow, what's the one thing that I would turn around and tell everybody? And it would be have more fun. Yes. <laughs> we really came here to have fun, to have yes. a good time. Like we forget about that, you know? And so that's that's also my special my something that I'm really good at yeah. finding the fun and uh, yeah. Ah, oh, that's so great. So, how do people get a hold of you? What is your website and your social media handles? Yeah, my website is www.charlenelight.com. So that's my full name, and then my I'm on IG, Instagram, and um, I have yet to join the the TikTok <laughs> <laughs> or anything else. I'm on YouTube, but I haven't done a whole lot on YouTube. So those are the really just IG, and then you can sign up for my newsletter, and that's where I share all the new offerings. And yeah, those are the big ones. So your Instagram is Charlene Light, right? Yes. Okay, so it's. C H A R L E N E L I T E. That is her Instagram handle. By the way, also, Charlene has a podcast. And do you want to tell us a little bit about that as well? Yes. Well, it started by, um, you know, that year that I spent tackling my fears. I, I, I wrote a blog about it. Then I'm like, well, let me make it a podcast so I can give you all the details that I couldn't really share in the blog. So the first season is all of those 40 fearless acts. Um, and then the second season is me moving here to wow. Paris which I moved in March and it's been and actually that first episode I got to say because I really walk you through like what it took I mean that was like a huge fear I, I had to work through a lot of fear moving mm-hmm. here I'm sure everybody can relate who's an expat so I but it's funny because I'll get messages from just random people like I loved your podcast about moving to Paris and da, da, da. so I think it's really important that we remember like we go through these things and we come out of it on the other side it's important to share these stories with people because they really do help yeah. You know, but yeah. And then I, I share all, all kinds of crazy stuff, like trying to find an apartment here and like all the things. That, oh, I mean, you know, the apartment, I mean, the bank, the, all of the, uh, like yeah, all yeah. of that is all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a story <laughs> for mm-hmm. each and every one of us. <laughs> totally. But yeah. It's called the fearless lady, the fearless lady. I love it. Uh, it, it sounds actually like incredibly bingeable. Like I feel like. Yes. Yes. I haven't started listening yet, but I have a feeling that when I do, I'm probably just going to like tear through it. So (laughs) that's incredible. 
Charlene, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been super powerful work. It's been just such a joy getting to know you. And Charlene is in Paris in case you didn't pick up on that throughout the course of this, <laughs> this episode. And she and I met actually at a cacao ceremony not too long ago. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, keep, keep your eyes peeled on social media. And if you are in Paris, we do have a divine feminine spiritual circle and that is a Facebook group. So if you're mm-hmm. interested in joining that, please let us know in the comments on social media. If you want to join, please just let us know that you want to join the Divine Feminine Spiritual Circle, and we will add you to the group. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. All right. Thank, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I've been meeting so many great people that are doing this work here in Paris, and I feel like we've, we've all been called to come here and to kind of- <laughs> 100% we have. 100%. Yeah, exactly. yeah absolutely. Cool, cool. All right. So as per usual, you know how to get a hold of me. If you haven't been to my podcast yet, and this is the first time listening, you can reach me at infinitesoullove.com and you can reach me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, as well as YouTube at infinitesoullove1111.